Thank, thank you very much, very interesting. Are you implying that evolution could not work very fast until a fairly complex organisms had evolved? And this might explain some of the stasis we observe in the evolution of early life. Yeah, so that's a, that's a very interesting observation. And um, it's also a complicated, uh, it's also a complicated problem. So let me give you two examples. One example that you know would seem to um, be against that view, and another one for that view, right? So I've talked about how bacteria innovate, right? Bacteria um, exchange genetic material all the time okay, in a form um, of actual sex, okay? Um, but their form of sex is in some ways fundamentally different from our form of sex. First of all, they don't use sex to reproduce just exchange snippets of, of, of DNA. Um, and then it's actually the case that bacteria that are very distantly related uh, can also exchange genetic material, as if we and a mouse, for example, could exchange genetic material. Right? Um, and that makes this form of innovation much more powerful, because mice, for example, have well evolved separately from us for about 100 million years. They have accumulated you know, different proteins, and combining those with our proteins would actually, you know, might actually, in some cases, be really helpful to solve some of the adaptive problems that environments pose. Right? So bacteria have mastered this, uh, and that's why, actually, even though they are very simple, they have small genomes, uh, they are actually very good and fast at innovating, and that's the root of the problem, of some of the problems that we're facing with things like antibiotic resistance. So that's one, uh, one argument there. The other argument is um, our genomes are fairly complex, and our genomes have actually an architecture that is, again, much more robust to change. So, for example, we have a, bacteria, a typical bacterial genome consists of 80 to 90 percent genes, and the rest of the DNA is what we call non-coding DNA. It's DNA that has a specific purpose, um, namely to regulate the genes. Okay? Uh, just to give you another number, um, in a bacterium like E. coli, two genes are typically separated by only 100 nucleotides, or 100 letters of non-coding DNA. Whereas in our genomes, almost everything is non-coding DNA. 97% of our DNA is non-coding. Only 3% are genes. So there is basically... Um, our genes are like islands in a vast ocean of non-coding DNA, and for a long time, people didn't know what that DNA was good for and whether it was good for anything, so they called it junk DNA. Um, now, it turns out that this DNA is a huge playground for evolution. And what I didn't mention, for example, is you know, how concretely genes are regulated. They're regulated through short words of DNA near a gene. And by near a gene means that it could be up to 100 million, it could be up to a million letters away or so from the gene, um, that are bound by specific proteins, like this NOx protein, uh, that interact with the gene and cause it to turn on or to turn off. Now, if you think about what are the chances um, to find, by random mutations alone, a new and useful regulatory word in a stretch of DNA that's a million letters long, or a stretch of DNA that's a hundred letters long, right? um, the chances are going to be much greater in the longer non-coding DNA. So, here is an argument uh, why complex organisms and complex systems with complex genomes, like us, should actually have a leg up over bacteria uh, in the rate at which they innovate. And fundamentally, the jury is still out which of these kinds of phenomena is more important. So there's arguments that speak uh, for us being more innovative and others that speak for bacteria being more innovative. Brilliant. Uh, uh, questions? Now, if I'm not seeing you, oh, right here. Excellent. Are there other, other questions before we get this one, so we can have the microphones moving around uh, up in the back there? So, um, yeah, the, the question is, um, so when I, when I arrived, I was thinking, okay, so 99.99, say, percent of mutations have a negative effect, mm -hmm. uh, obviously leaving a small fraction of things that leave a positive effect. Mm -hmm. Is a suggestion that actually maybe there's a whole chunk of that that just have no effect whatsoever? Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, so that's basically what's going on. Yeah, so we, people have studied very carefully uh, what they call the spectrum of mutational effects uh, in organisms, in different organisms, and what you see is that there is some fraction of mutations that have no effect. Uh, we call them neutral mutations. Depends on the kind of system that you're looking at, but they're typically at least 20 or 30 percent. And then um, the re most of the rest have bad effects, and... Interestingly, though, most of these bad effects are very, very small. You know, they might, for example, reduce the ability of a bacterium to divide or a plant to produce seeds by less than a percent. Okay, it's very, very small effects. They are so small, they're sometimes not visible to our technology, but we know um, that they're actually visible to natural selection on the long time scales on which evolution unfolds. And then um, there is an even smaller fraction of mutations that have positive effects. Um, but the fact that these neutral mutations exist, it's just another way of saying you know, we have these networks in, the, in nature's libraries, right? They allow populations to explore the library and find those small, that small fraction of good mutations that they need to improve a biological system. It's like, it's like a potential energy kind of thing. Yes, yeah, you can think of it that way. That's how a physicist would probably um, mm -hmm. view it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, thank you for a really enjoyable, interesting talk. I was just wondering what you thought was, um, is the most, um, well, is the greatest innovation um, or mutation or something that humans have made biologically over our history, really? That's a difficult one. <laughs> um, well, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, being anthropocentric, you know, being one of us, I'd say, you know, it's our brain and, and our ability to uh, use symbols. That's really what distinguishes us uh, in a crucial way from a lot of other organisms. But, you know, other people could have very different opinions about that, and that would have to be respected. Excellent. That's an excellent way to answer that question. Well done. <laughs> other, other questions? And if I'm, if I'm not seeing up in the upper decks, please, please let me know. There's a question in the back there. Hi, yeah, so you spoke about the fact that when you have increased complexity, you, you tend to have more kind of ways for innovation and stuff. Um, if you have like sort of changes in the system, do you think that's because you've got an increased probability of redundancy in the system or because there are just generally more options it can take? Uh, very good point. Okay, so let me give you um, an example for both, for redundancy and for something else altogether. Um, that both of which increase complexity uh, and actually cause or in increase the innovation potential of organisms in different ways. There's a phenomenon that I haven't talked about but that we study very intensely in the, in the lab and it's called gene duplication. It's the process by which pieces of DNA in our genome um, get copied sometimes and pasted elsewhere into the genome. And it's something that happens by accident as a result of DNA repair mechanisms that occur always, um, that take place always in the life of organisms. And so after such a, a duplication, you sometimes get two copies of the same gene in the genome. Um, that's an example of redundancy, right? That is, um, you have two two parts of a biological system, like you might have multiple light bulbs in the house, and you know, one of these, and if one of these burns out, then uh, others can serve as a backup. And you have exactly the same kind of situation uh, in, in, in genetics. Now, uh, because one of, genes, of these two genes can serve as a backup for the other, uh, the other one is free to actually evolve a new function, right? Nothing can happen as long as the backup is there. Uh, this is one of those situations where actually missteps in the library may not have fatal consequences if, um, if um, you know, an evolving new gene um, <coughs> You know, produces by, by accident you know, some protein that uh, doesn't do what it's supposed to do if the other gene still provides the backup. And it turns out that such gene duplications are, there's a massive amounts of them, for example, 50% of our genes have some duplicate in the genome, uh, and they have had crucial roles in the radiation and evolutionary success of certain groups of animals and plants. For example, um, 
the evolution of flowering plants with very, very complex flowering architectures has probably been driven or has been made possible by a, a complex series of gene duplications in the genes that are uh, responsible for the development of flowers. So that's one example where redundancy is really important. I'll give you now another one that's nothing at all about redundancy, and it's about the architecture of metabolism. Uh, metabolism, I said, is a complex network of chemical reactions. And you can think of it as like a highway system of a city. Right? So there's feeder highways, there's feeder roads that um, basically represent peripheral sequences of chemical reactions that convert nutrients in the environment um, into forms a metabolism can use. Then there's a central core of this highway system um, that, um, that converts energy in these nutrients into useful forms. And there is another peripheral, a set of peripheral roads that actually correspond to sequences of reactions that manufacture things that are useful. And like any highway system, um, you know, when you, well, actually, any well-designed highway systems, I'm not sure whether, you know, this is the case for the UK highway system. You know, <laughs> if, you, if you block some of the roads in such a highway system, there's usually detours mm -hmm. around the blocked roads. And this is the way metabolism is built. Okay? Uh, very interesting architecture, and we studied that architecture too in the lab. Um, uh, that is, this is not really a redundant, a system that contains redundancy, because every chemical reaction in such a metabolism may be unique, uh, such like every road leads to a unique uh, series of destinations, but the networks of roads is built in such a way that um, one roadblock is not fatal for the whole transportation system. Okay? So this is a, a class uh, of systems that does not necessarily contain a whole lot of redundancy, still is highly robust. And, um, it's innovative for reasons, therefore, that have nothing to do with redundancy. Yeah. Right. We've got one question here. Am I missing a question over here anywhere? Ah, one more up there. Let's do that one up there and then come down here. Sorry, this question is quite similar to the gentleman's at the front. But I was wondering, you were talking about uh, nature's uh, great innovators. Uh, and I was wondering whether there's actually anything special about all those organisms or whether they've just chanced uh, across the right book in the library. Um, Personally, I don't think that uh, we know whether there's some organisms that are more innovative than others uh, in the long run of their uh, evolutionary history. Um, the ones that I mentioned are you know, just examples where that are especially good because we understand what went on. You, know, you have to understand that studying the natural history of a particular innovation or evolutionary adaptation is very difficult business. And part of the reason is that most of these innovations involve multiple kinds of changes in um, different kinds of systems, like in metabolism or regulatory systems, and it's very, very hard to figure out what's going on. So organisms made you know, billions of innovations, and we understand perhaps a hundred of them really well. Um, so we don't simply know enough about them uh, to say whether some organisms are much better than others in innovating. Brilliant. And finally, one more question. Uh, thank you. I'm just looking for a, a simple mind model of robustness and resilience. Um, and thinking about your enzyme example, you may have a dog, and your dog may lose a leg in an accident, mm -hmm. but it can still run around and bark and chase mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And you would say, that's a dog, and, but it would have three legs. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, you can imagine a dog with this invisible fifth leg, which mm -hmm. we don't see and we don't see a benefit for. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about robustness and resilience, is it the dog going from four to three legs, but still behaving like a dog in all the ways that you see a dog function, or is it this concept of the dog losing something that we don't see any benefit for, nor does the dog at that stage, mm -hmm. in terms of how it behaves and operates? Actually, I think that both of these happen. So, you know, some kinds of changes cause the dog to, to lose a leg, okay? and some kinds of changes are actually the more interesting one, uh, um, translated into the language of enzymes. They, they cause that enzyme to have something extraneous that is not obviously useful at the time that it arises, but it can actually turn out to be very useful millions of years later, for example, in a new environment. Okay. So uh, let me give you a concrete example. Um, 
and again, I know more about enzymes than I know about dogs, so I, <laughs> I will use an enzyme again. <laughs> um, and the concrete example is um, so-called promiscuous enzymes. So these are enzymes that catalyze a particular chemical reaction that is sort of their main job in the body. And it turns out if you use you know, sensitive biochemical technologies, you can find out that they also catalyze some other reactions that have nothing to do with their function in the body. Uh, and sometimes more than one additional reaction, two, three, four, or five. Um, these reactions, as far as we know, don't have any use um, in the organisms that have been studied. But when we actually stick these enzymes into the laboratory and perform evolution experiments with them, uh, that means we mutate them and we select for these alternative or promiscuous reactions. That is, we ask these enzymes to become better at performing them uh, or catalyzing them, uh, and that works actually really well. So what you can think of is that these enzymes have extraneous features um, that are, you might call them latent innovations. Uh, that is, they don't serve a purpose, they may be caused by some you know, additional part of the amino acid string uh, that they have uh, compared to, to, to some other enzymes. We often don't know. But in the right environment where these chemical reactions can not only become useful, but perhaps necessary for survival, um, they can be crucial to ensure uh, the survival of an organism and therefore become true innovations. So um, to us actually, and this is really a frontier of research these days, um, these kinds of latent innovations are um, very interesting, very curious phenomena because we don't know much about them and we don't know how frequent they are. We know they occur in some enzymes um, and we suspect that may actually occur in many, um, meaning that latent innovation like that or a latent innovation potential may be something that's really ubiquitous in life. Meaning that many dogs may have, you know, a fifth cryptic leg, if you will. <laughs> right, brilliant. Please join me in thanking our speaker, Professor Wagner, for an excellent conversation tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs>